Welcome to the Beast Rider Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Sakamoto, and today we are going to be discussing and continuing our 49ers coverage as it pertains to their salary cap. Now, if you watched my last two podcasts, it was in regards to Richard Sherman and Trent Williams and the pros and cons of re-signing those players or simply letting them walk. And we also discussed on how that would affect the compensatory selections moving forward. Now, let's go ahead and tie in that podcast or those specific podcasts into this one. That's how I run and formulate my podcast so you guys are in the know before they know. And as we paint this picture, you can kind of connect the dots. Make sense? It makes sense. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, I'm picking up subscribers left and right. So thank you for everyone for tuning in and hitting the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen as you stay up to date on all things Beast in real time. Be sure to also turn on the bell notifications so you get notified when I go live or when I upload content. All right, so let's delve right into it and As it pertains to this podcast, we're going to be breaking down how the 49ers can cut two players, saving the team roughly $20 million. All right, $20 million, that's a lot of bread. I mean, $1 million is a lot of bread. But for the NFL standard, $20 million is a lot of bread. All right, $1 million, not so much. But all right, lucky for them. Let's talk about it and let's get right into it as we break it down brick by brick. All right, so the 49ers currently have $13.2 million in salary cap health. That's not bad compared to the NFC West when you look at teams like the Arizona Cardinals, who obviously have about that much base in spending. But then you look at teams like the Seattle Seahawks and the LA Rams, who are just basically in salary cap hell and salary cap strapped. All right, so when you take that into account and with the cap decreasing from 198 to roughly $175 million because of the lack of revenue generated from obviously COVID-19 season, the teams, or I would say all 30 NFL teams, are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, this year is going to be a lot different than in years past because, again, due to COVID, there's a lot of restraints, right? You, you don't really have an NFL combine. Pro days are kind of up in the air as to how and what number of scouts or front office personnel can attend a pro day. And so there's a lot of, how I should say, Everything is foreign, I should say, right? So with a new year and a new season, this is kind of like the new norm until we we can get COVID underway. So with that being said, let's look at those two players that I discussed and how the team could save roughly $20 million on, and whether or not that's a smart play. All right. So the 49ers must cut these two players before June 1. All right, they must cut D Ford, and that would save the team $5.7 million. And they must cut Weston Richburg, which would save an additional $4.5 million. When you add that up, that's $10.2 million in cap savings, right? And before you guys point out, oh, we can cut D Ford post June 1, because instead of saving, let's say, $5.7 million, we'd be saving an additional $15.2 million instead. Well, I would disagree that you shouldn't make that play because what you're getting here is you're going to be able to target leftovers after June 1 because by then the free agent market has dried up. So by you waiting and taking a back seat for cutting D4 just to save an excess $10 million doesn't make real financial sense because the time to strike is now. And it's like targeting leftovers right you're going to target leftovers and the free agent market that's like going to a buffet and settling for salisbury steaks instead of wagyu beef and i got that from my man freeman freeman is my buddy who dropped a comment section in an earlier podcast as it relates to (laughs) <laughs> Trent Williams being resigned and how that would compare to the rest of the offensive line. Obviously, the, the rest of the offensive line would be Salisbury's, and Trent Williams would be the Wagyu Kobe beef. So, my hats off to Vernon Freeman. That that um kind of made my day. I told him that in the comments section that um I LLL'd after that. So, yeah. Cheers, man. Cheers, man. But yeah, it makes sense, right? It re- totally makes sense. So, that's why I say you save the team $10.2 million by cutting both D Ford and Weston Richburg now before June 1 because again you don't want to be stuck with leftovers and even though you have 10 million in cap savings after June 1 how many free agents are going to be left on the open market 
I mean, it's slim pickings at that point, right? So with the money that you're saving, you don't want to go into free agency. So I bring it up. Oh, you know, do you really want to attack free agency in the first place? If you're GM John Lynch, you're like, no, because I have to resign who? Fred Warner, who I stated in my earlier podcast three months ago that he should be resigned. And then reports came out months later that, yeah, Fred Warner needs to be resigned. Everybody was saying, oh, no, he's still on the rookie deal. I was like, okay, dude. That's why Fred Warner dad likes my stuff on Twitter and follows me and follows this podcast because I'm, again, be in the know before you know, bro. Just saying. Be in the know before you know. I called it and then Richard Sherman echoed it that he probably won't likely won't be back because of the fact that they have to resign who? Fred Warner, who's guaranteed what? At least 18 to $20 million. And the reason I say 18 to $20 million, again, if you watch my earlier podcast in the year or if you're just subscribing to my channel, I do uh, I do have. I do have a podcast playlist that you can see in the description below in all my episodes. You can play catch up. Also, at the end of each podcast episode, I have a podcast power playlist. You can go ahead and click on that and see what I had to say in real time and how that podcast relates to this one. And you will know that I was the first one to report it. So getting back to Fred Warner. Yeah, he's going to be do a front loaded deal because Bobby Wagner, who is the highest paid middle linebacker when you compare it annual per year, he was getting paid $18 million over the course of the last two years. I said back in 2019 that Fred Warner was the best. No one really thought that until 2020, which is why, again, this is why you follow me. And I said that Fred Warner was getting paid, vastly underpaid, even though he was on a rookie deal. He was still outperforming Bobby Wagner. And he guess how much Bobby, um, excuse me, guess how much Fred Warner was getting paid over the last two years outperforming Bobby Wagner. Less than a million dollars, bro. Less than a million dollars. So you don't think he's going to be do a front-loaded contract when he's over $34 million in guaranteed already? Of course he is. And Fred Warner should not accept anything less. Now, I did point out that he could have the similar impact that DeForest Buckner had because, again, the 49ers are in salary cap hell, so to speak, because at the end of the day, they can't re-sign everyone. You have so many free agents coming up. You have Juice, right? Kyle Juszczyk. You have Trent Williams. We also talked about Richard Sherman. He likely won't be back. But then you guys, you got guys like Kerry Hyder Jr. and Jason Verrett, guys who really shined last year. So what direction GM John Lynch goes in, that's all in his hand, right? But the first priority should be re-signing Fred Warner in a front-loaded deal, and Fred Warner himself should not accept anything less than a front-loaded contract because, again, you're not banking on his future potential like Eric Armstead, who had a one great one-year wonder in 2019. You're banking on what you're getting consistently from Fred Warner, and that's the heart and soul of the, the best middle linebacker in the game. All right, but getting back to this podcast and how it relates to this podcast, then let's take it a step further to peel back another layer of the onion to really get to the core, right? You look at guys like Levante David, who just played in the Super Bowl with the Tampa Bay Bucks. He signed a five-year, $50 million contract, I believe, in 2015. So he's due for a front-loaded deal on another contract. He's going to help reset the market. Then you look at the 2018 draft class that Fred Warner was in. You look at the first-round picks, right? So you take a look at Guys like Roquan Smith out of Chicago Bears, who's playing at an all-pro level. Then you look at the Buffalo Bills with Tremaine Edmonds playing at an all-pro level. You don't think those guys are also going to help reset the market? You'd be doing yourself a disservice if, you, again, you don't do the research and just focus on the team that you're covering or the team that you like. You have to know what's going on, what's going around the NFL in order to formulate this analysis. I'm just saying. So that's why you guys follow me because, again, I cover all 32 NFL teams. I stay unfiltered. I'm not biased. I don't care. And that's what's going to happen. You're going to see all these middle linebackers getting paid. So the 49ers should strike first and re-sign Fred Warner before those guys start raising the bar. It's common sense, bro. It's just common sense. you got to strike first like Cobra Kai. No, I'm joking. Uh, anybody who watches Cobra Kai on Netflix, you're a fan. I like Cobra Kai. I know some people say it's kind of like a douchebaggy, but hey, man, I like the storyline. It's awesome. But yeah. Then what's going to happen when you wipe your hands clean of Weston Richburg, right? So now there's a hole at center. Well, a guy that I like and who I'm really high on, maybe because I'm an Alabama fan, but I really like Landon Dickerson. Now, Landon Dickerson has had his history, has had a history of injuries over the course of his career. However, most recently he has a torn ACL, but I think he would be a nice day two pick. He is the best offensive lineman in terms of the center position in this upcoming draft. Now, Creed Humphreys is also good, but I really like Landon Dickerson. I am 
a firm believer that you can build the team around him. He brings a nasty mean streak. He's tough. He's reliable. He's physical. These things that haven't been seen since Jeremy Newberry. Right? And Jeremy Newberry was a perennial all, uh, Pro Bowl player. And those who remember number 62 know what he brings to the table. And I see similar skill sets when it comes to Landon Dickerson, a true leader who can win down in the trenches and solidify the offensive line, making the line calls and having his players and his teammates in the best position to make plays based on the coverage assignments that they're asked in pass, pro, or run blocking. All right. But. If not Landon Dickerson, because are, your guys are having nightmares of Trent Baalke drafting ACL players, then why not Quinn Miners? Quinn Miners, the, the Division Three kid that rose at the Senior Bowl and played up to the D1 competition and is now in discussion for a Day 2, Day 3 pick. He would be a nice find as a Day 2 selection. I don't like the idea of the 49ers drafting an edge rusher to fill the need. If they were to release D4, because again, if you watch my Twitter receipts, you will know that I said, I'm not afraid to say it, the edge class is weak sauce. So all these edge rushers are going to get pushed up the board because of that. In fact, I don't see an edge worthy of a first round grade. I just don't see it. But every team has 32 picks. Obviously, these players are going to get pushed up, and edge class is no exception, all right? So, with that being said, I would rather the 49ers not reach for an edge in round one if they were to get, like, a Gregory Rousseau on the board or if Jalen Phillips is on the board or one of those guys. I would not target those guys. I would rather pick a cornerback like J.C. Horn, as I stated in an earlier podcast, if Patrick Sertan is off the board, or trade back, stockpile more picks, and then possibly get a guy like running back Najee Harris. In the late teens or early 20s. That's where I see him mocked. And that's a hot spot. Alright. Well. That'll be it for today. I hope you liked what I had to offer. If you did. Please hit the subscribe button. In the lower right hand corner of your screen. As we keep all things beast. I'll be sure to put up another podcast. As it relates to the NFL mock draft. And my thoughts and analysis on that. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Beast Rider. Out.